Welcome back to the Sampan Viking on China channel. And as again before, we are going to be sticking with the Ukraine because this is undoubtedly the biggest story of the moment, even though I had planned to talk a little bit about the Solomon Islands, but um, I, I, there's not really enough there beyond just a couple of minutes of discussion. So I'm going to stick with the Ukraine, which is a much bigger story and one of greater consequence, I think, both to China and to um, well, most of us in the world. We are living in strange times. I, I don't know why else we can say it. The divergence in the perception of reality between those that um, follow the Eastern narrative, um, those that follow the Western narrative, couldn't become ever wider. Um, and all that we can try and do is piece together the evidence on the ground from the battlefield, such as it is, and to say, well, which correlates with, you know, with what reality must be um, based on what we see uh, and which comes closer to the two narratives that we have got. Uh, I think there is very little doubt that the grinding, remorseless process of slow advance and attrition by the Russians against the Ukrainians is where the direction of the conflict is. We are seeing a constant fall of new small settlements. We are seeing constant activity into the fortifications that the Ukrainians, old and new, that the Ukrainians have dug in around the Donbass. And we are seeing that tightening um, as the forces slowly, slowly, kilometer by kilometer, inch their way forwards under a heavy barrage of artillery as it literally blasts a path through all the prepared defences. And against all this, we get an ever increasingly shrill, I have to say, um, commentary coming with the Western narrative um, of victory after victory after victory after victory, but none of which seem to really stack up on the ground um, when you when you look at them. And the obvious thing to look at is to say, well, who holds the battlefield? Because at the end of the day, it's, it's not impossible, but losers don't tend to hold the battlefield unless simply having, you know, an attacker having done a huge amount of damage simply withdraws and leaves the, you know, holding it um, because there's nothing else of value there. They've destroyed pretty much what they've come to do. But on the whole, you have to say that uh, with the engagements that we're having seen reported and discussed in the media, it, the claims of victory, Snake Island, uh, very clearly the Ukrainians, whatever they did, did not take that island. If they were making a serious bid, they must have suffered very heavy losses out of that, which seems to be confirmed by the loss of some fairly senior helicopter pilots, senior officers, um, staff officers. Um, the footage that we've had, it doesn't really make much sense for that, that to be Russian. They have to be Ukrainian, and in which case um, they lost the assault that was supposed to steal the thunder of the May the 9th parade was a dramatic failure. And again, they're just trying to put a spin on it and say, oh, look at the damage that we did. But the, the lack of um, the lack of outrage from the other side rather suggests that, that is not the case. The the battle for Kharkov. I mean, we won the battle of Kharkov, they said on the uh, on the media meaning the Ukrainian side. Well, I, I have to say I wasn't aware there had been a battle of Kharkov, and I think it probably came as a surprise to the Russians as well. Um, I'm probably wondering how they could have missed it one with them being in the vicinity, wondering who, who it was between. Um, we had, I think, it, I've heard it described very um, succinctly as a fixing operation. Uh, very small numbers of Russian troops were left after the end of phase one, um, as the Ukrainians concentrated forces for their offensive, the Russians just fell back progressively to a, no doubt, a prepared defensive line. And there it seems to be holding. Um, uh, you know, they, they couldn't, the Russian was in no position to do anything to Kharkov. Um, so as long as the Ukrainians decided to tie up um, and hold in place large numbers of men and equipment um, that could be probably better employed elsewhere, the Russian high command are going to be very, very pleased with this, I am sure. Um, 
the story of the river crossing of the Sevets Donets River. Um, everything between one to three battle groups of Soviet armor annihilated in a failed crossing. Um, yeah, okay. What have we had to support this? Well, we've had a few photographs and a little bit of drone footage. Um, all of it at a distance, I have to say. Most of the photographs were drone photographs as well. And it showed a battlefield. Um, no doubt about it, there had been a major battle at that location. And what we saw at the point in which these pictures and video were taken was a situation where the two, two bridges were destroyed and there was equipment on both sides of the river. Um, the Ukrainian side were claiming it was all Russian and all destroyed. Uh, a closer inspection shows that a lot of it probably wasn't Russian and quite a lot of it wasn't actually destroyed. What we do know from reports that have been coming out from that area over the last few weeks is that there has been a lot of intense firefights, mostly across the river. So it looks as though there had been artillery and armoured duels going across from one bank to the other, followed by the amphibious assault by the Russians across to the east bank of the Sevets Donets um, River. Uh, amphibious assaults are expensive. D-Day. Um, the uh, the United States uh, marine landings in you know, Iwo Jima and all the rest of it in World War Two, they are expensive operations. Um, you are going to take losses and they can be high, um, but clearly nothing like what's being claimed by the Ukrainian side. And the important thing I think is that clearly the Russians did get across. They won the battle and they've established a bridgehead. And this, I think, is testified to by the reports of fighting um, in the towns just within uh, that, uh, including Sovets itself, there's Sovets, um, where they're saying that the local authority is evacuating over to the Dnipro um, because it's no longer safe. Well, if it's, you know, if the Russians hadn't got across, it would be no less safe today than it was two weeks ago. So clearly something has changed and it can only be a successful amphibious crossing and now a successfully working bridgehead on the east side of the, of the river in that neighborhood. Um, and again, the other thing that clinches it for me, we only have drone footage, we only have distant photographs. Um, and I know they sort of mixed it in with a couple of close-ups um, with a, you know one or two troops by a tank, a burnt out tank. That's not good enough. Uh, if you want to prove to me and to anybody, really, um, that the Ukrainian side has won a major battle, then you need to show me large Ukrainian formations um, mingling quite freely um, amongst the wreckage of the, the battle that corresponds perfectly on the ground to the aerial footage that has been provided. This is the trouble with Twitter. Uh, you get a few seconds shots here, a couple of photos here. It's a snapshot of a few seconds from an engagement that may have lasted for weeks. No way can that represent a fair picture, or accurate picture, of what has been going on. And I think with Seves Donets we see that in absolute spades. Um, I wonder now if, you know, if the bridges have been repaired again uh, and, uh, you know, equipment is crossing. Like I said, a lot of the equipment that I looked at in the photographs that even the Ukrainians provided didn't look damaged, didn't, didn't look damaged at all. And in fact, it looked neatly parked up, um, you know, in, on the side of the road, leaving a, a good, uh, leaving a, a clear path, uh, no sign of bodies. It didn't look like the aftermath of a major defeat. Um, like we have seen in some other locations. So again, this is a major defeat for the Ukrainians and they're desperately trying to spin it as a victory. Um, and of course they need to, uh, and our governments need to, because at the end of the day, with the amount of money and material being provided by Western governments to the Ukraine and the cost of the, the sanctions on their own citizens that um, the sanctions regime employed on account of the Ukrainian um, crisis is costing. 
if there was any suggestion that it wasn't actually achieving anything, I think there'd be riots in the, in the streets. I, I really do. So they've got to maintain the fiction of victory at all costs. And we're seeing this even now with the surrender at Mariupol. With them, oh, the pompous with it. Combat operations in Mariupol have now finished and we are evacuating our remaining forces. Uh, no, the combat mission ended some time ago and they've been holed up in, uh, in bunkers underneath a factory and now they're surrendering because they have absolutely, they've run out of morale um, as well as everything else. It's over. They're finished. Um, there's no more fight left in them and they have been taken prisoners of war. And as for this Ukraine government is, is making efforts to release, the, um, you know, to rescue the rest. Um, it sounds fine. It sounds like a column's on its way. It's nothing of the sort. They're just trying to beg the Russians to take them alive, I think. And that is the depths to which we have now sunk. Oh, other, of course, that um, apparently Mr. Putin is now is now micromanaging the uh, the military operation himself. Well, quite a remarkable thing for a man in his delicate state of health, as he has been diagnosed, I think, with at least three, last count that I could remember, three chronic um, terminal uh, conditions. Um, you know, but yet somehow he has the energy to uh, oversee um, down to platoon level, the operations of the special military operation in Ukraine. I mean, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> do I look like a five-year-old? Really? Please, please, don't, don't, don't. Please don't. What can I say? It's infantile. It really is. Uh, the level of the propaganda being put out is just infantile. What we have is an unrelenting campaign that is destroying the Ukraine military bit by bit. We are now seeing the graphic footage, both by drones and by helm cam of uh, Go, no, Go, GoPro cameras, as they as uh, as forces fight their way through the t uh, the trench systems. They've got into the trenches. They're fighting their way through. They're clearing them. They're inflicting incredibly heavy casualties. And they're now starting to make serious inroads into these held areas. And the formation of individual cauldrons it is getting highly visible. And it's not impossible. They may hold out like they did in Mariupol, but not every Ukrainian soldier is an Azov fanatic. And I think before very long, the effect of constant bombardment, the lack of supplies, the collapse of morale, I would not be surprised if we start seeing some very substantial surrenders uh, across wide fronts in the Donbass in the not too distant future. Well, we'll see, but it does seem to be the most likely outcome. Well, that's just a quick roundup, really, of, of the events that, um, you know, that have been taking place over the last few days. And I didn't even talk about New York. Oh, well, uh, talk about making yourself hostage to fortune, Mr. Poroshenko. Um, but the Russians apparently have also taken New York. Anyway, um, uh, that, I think, is going to be all for today. I hope you enjoyed the roundup and, the, uh, and I hope the clear looked, uh, the clear examination of a, of, of a sentiment and, uh, and propaganda fogged uh, field. If you liked what I had to say, please hit the like button. Um, if you're not a subscriber, please do subscribe. It's free and it does help the channel to grow. If you'd like other people to hear what I have to say, please share. And if you would like to make a comment or ask a question about any sub part of this subject or the channel in general, please leave a comment and I will respond as best I can where it is appropriate to do so as quickly as I can. Thank you very much.